Well, this savings and loan crisis thing has really struck a responsive chord around the United States. We've been getting more mail from the programs which we've done on the savings and loan crisis with Rob Whittison than any other subject, uh, even those of the CIA or the Kennedy assassination. People are astounded by it and they want to hear more about it. And you're becoming, you're becoming a superstar. Everybody's getting these letters, you know, they want to know about you and people stopping you on the streets. And not only that, Rob has become uh, one of the country's experts and has been taken into the confidence of some of the high executives of these <laughs> savings and loan institutions. Investment bankers are, are calling him up and spilling their guts to him and business organization calling him. Tell us what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of this? This is the weirdest situation I think I've ever seen and all of this seems to be focused on you because you uh, I've been writing articles and uh, been on TV and people recognize you and think you've got all the answers <laughs> <laughs> well I don't have many answers but I have been studying this uh, pretty carefully for a year and uh, uh, the more I probe into it uh, the more detail I see naturally and uh, so one of the problems is that now that I've been doing it for so long, I have a kind of a responsibility to try and explain uh, what I see hap uh, happening and uh, what has happened uh, to cause this uh, enormous uh, financial disaster. Rob, well, let's see today if we can get the uh, big picture. So far, all the media has done in this SNL crisis is to blame guys like Neil Bush or Charles King as if it's just a few entrepreneurs that went uh, berserk, rich kids uh, gambling with uh, the taxpayers' money, that that's all the savings and loan scandal really amounts to. But there's much more behind this, isn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, it appears that there were uh, structural changes in many areas that relate to uh, thrift banking that really... Uh, created as much of this disaster as the um, these evil uh, uh, SNL owners like uh, Keating and Don Dixon. You mean like changes in the laws and uh, uh -huh. policy of oh, regulatory man. agencies? And, and uh, what the federal government did to these people is just brutal. I mean, for the, those people who are interested in conspiracy theories, I'm sure somebody <laughs> could find something. Yeah, I'm not going to uh, come up with anything uh, um, right today but uh, <laughs> I mean there's some threads in here that are really nasty yeah uh, well tell us about what some of these changes apparently they made changes and lured some of these uh, naughty exactly, guys into exactly exactly that's exactly what happened <laughs> okay uh, first of all uh, it's pretty well known that uh, at the end of the 70s the thrift industry was on the ropes right. uh, because of rising interest rates and uh, uh, the thrifts had their money uh, invested in long-term mortgages and uh, as interest rates on deposits rose people took their money out of thrifts and put them in um, money market funds uh, banks and other agencies that uh, give them a uh, higher return so um, now thrifts were carefully regulated uh, and had been all throughout their history uh, they were designed just for uh, uh, single-family homes basically uh, well, in 1980, the first step was taken, and that was to lift the cap on interest rates and raise the amount of insurance for each deposit uh, to $100,000. Okay, now that one's pretty well known. Now, in addition, right around that time, because the thrift industry was in so much trouble, the regulators began to grant what they call forbearances. Uh, now. Part of the regula uh, regulatory apparatus was that each thrift had to maintain a certain amount of reserve money on hand. It was calculated as a percentage of assets, assets being uh, out outstanding loans and any uh, property uh, or any other asset that uh, the thrift owned. Uh, and they had to maintain 5%. Uh, which means that if the thrift was liquidated on a given day, they had to have at least 5% left. Anything under that, and they were in violation of the rules, and technically they were insolvent, they could be closed. But because uh, the whole industry was in trouble, the regulators took it easy on them, and they granted uh, forbearances, which allowed them to carry uh, a lower capital reserve 
than the law required. Now what that effectively meant was, if you, if you were a thrift owner, and that 5% that capital reserve was really your profit, because if you liquidated the thrift on any given day, what was left over was what you took home. So, in the early 80s, with these four, uh, when the thrifts were in trouble, there were, many of the thrifts had no capital reserve, which meant that the owner had no more stake in the thrift. He had already oh. lost his money, see? So, so anything that he could grab then, exactly. in any way, was his. Exactly. And turn into assets that could be personal or corporate that he could exactly. control outside of the and, framework. And, of and the so then personnel. it meant that he really had no loyalty to the organization. Exactly. Because he had no money in it. Oh. He had already lost his money. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> and this began actually with Carter or when Reagan um, first came in as president? Well, the, the problems in the thrift industry uh, began in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, it dates back to uh, us going off the gold standard and floating interest rates and all of that. It goes back to Nixon, really. Uh huh, exactly, right. 71. And then the high inflation under Carter and uh -huh. high interest rates. Exactly. And, and they forced them to give a lot of money. I was getting 17% at one time yeah. uh, for money market well, uh, prime, thrift certificates. Prime rate got up over 20% at one right. point in the 78 thing. So uh, uh, there's a, a point about the psychology here. The regulators were giving everybody a break because they didn't want to have to shut it, shut it all down. They didn't have enough money in the, interest, in the insurance fund to cover all these deposits anyway. The FSLIC. The FSLIC, mm -hmm. right. So uh, the owners were kind of set up already psychologically. <laughs> now in 1982, the famous Deregulation Act occurs, and that's Garn San Germain. Uh, we've all we've heard of it. We've talked about that, all the right. skullduggery and corruption that went on in that. Right. Well, uh, let, me, let me just uh, go through a couple of the provisions of Garn San Germain and show how they, they had, the kind of effect they had. First of all, they dropped the capital requirement from 5% to 3%. Uh -huh. Okay, so that meant your reserves had only to be 3%. Now that had an interesting effect, particularly with the people that wanted to buy in. Okay, they didn't need as much. They didn't need as much. So if you mm -hmm. had a hundred million dollar bank, a medium sized uh, thrift that was up for sale in a small town in Texas, for example, uh, all you needed to come up with was three million bucks to buy that bank, and you set that aside as a capital reserve, and you were off and running. And some people bought some very big banks with even less than that. Yeah, well, there's some famous stories of this Florida guy. Uh huh, exactly. With promises that they were going to make it up and they had investors and all of this. Now, the other, uh, another interesting part of Garn Saint Germain was it allowed the banks to take 6% loan origination fee on any loan they made. Now, what that means huh. is that you go into a town, you buy a $100 million bank, you put up 3 million bucks. The next thing you do is you loan that 100 million out and you take a 6% loan origination fee and you just put $3 million in your pocket. So you're, you're being paid to loan money to whoever. Exactly. Any shady wheeler or dealer, hey, you're going to get a 6% you took it fee front. and the government will insure the loan if it goes bad. Exactly, and you took it up front. So you're encouraged to give bad loans by this bill. In a sense, yes. And they didn't make any difference to them if they were paid back or not because they had their 6% exactly. up front. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now, the, uh, savings and loans were allowed by Garn Saint Germain to branch out into all kinds of investments. In fact, they were allowed to uh, invest directly in commercial real estate projects. So, what they all did was uh, the minute Garn Saint Germain was passed, they all set up a holding company, a construction holding company, um, uh, sort of off to the side. And then, they would uh, loan money to the construction company, and the construction company would go ahead and develop uh, property. So the first thing they all did was uh, they designed office towers. And uh, they counted on themselves to be a primary tenant. So they built themselves buildings. Okay. They loaned themselves money, built themselves buildings. Right, and then they charged themselves exorbitant rent which came out of the deposits <laughs> exactly. of, of the savings and loans. Exactly, right? exactly. And, their, and they and could take it as profit. And uh -huh. their loan fee, they got on top of all the rest of it. Exactly, right. exactly. God. Now, another thing they were allowed to do, and this is, I mean, just gets more and more incredible. 
hundred percent financing. So, borrower comes into your bank, he's got this project he wants to do, he needs fifty million dollars. Well, they never asked him what he was going to give him up front. They just said, okay, we'll lend you the fifty million. They didn't have to put up a dime. They didn't check to see if the guy was had credit worthy. Or well, they were like supposed that? to check that. It was called due diligence, but it, it was left <coughs> left uh, for somebody else. Diligence to pop up. was lacking. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and as part of the deal, they would loan a little extra. Like if you wanted fifty million, they would loan you fifty-eight million. They'd set the eight million aside in an escrow account to pay off the interest the first year's uh, 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 premiums. Oh my God. Right. So. The developer never put in a penny. The bank loans out the 50 million bucks. Right? The payments are made on time. They're just pulled out of the escrow account that the bank also loaned as part of the deal. Right? So the, uh, the developer didn't have to put up a penny. So this encouraged a lot of development that wasn't needed. I mean, already Houston, for instance, had about a 50% vacancy rate on their office buildings, right? And throughout Texas, this uh -huh. was the case. Exactly. Now, and there, there's a lot more. And here in Austin, we got all these buildings and nobody's in. Oh, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> now, there's a, there's a reason for that, and I'm getting to okay. it. Okay. There's one other point I want to make about Garn San Germain. All right. And this is really a killer. They were allowed to loan money on the appraised value of a piece of property. Not on the purchase price, on the appraised value. So, who is appraising? Well, you, you, go, you go around town, you get an appraiser, but of course the appraisers are going, you know, they, they, they listen to the tone <laughs> of your voice. You know, and if you're telling them you're going to build the Taj Mahal, with, you're going to cover it with mosaics this big and it's going to cost 100 million bucks, well, they, you know, you're suddenly still, that's the price. Exactly. So, I mean, you bought a piece of land for $5 million and you're going to put a $100 million development on it, then uh, 100 million bucks was the appraisal and that's how much you could loan out. And was the appraisers getting kickbacks or were they getting percentages based upon the appraiser? Uh-huh. Uh, of course. Uh, gen that's standard fees, uh -huh. right? Exactly. So, <laughs> okay. Now, here comes a big kicker. One of the very first things that Ronald Reagan did when he got into office was he pushed through the Tax Reform Act of 1981. Now, there were two major clauses of this Tax Reform Act. One was it dropped the um, uh, tax rate for the very wealthy, the highest bracket, from 78% to 73% to 28%. Okay. That's a big drop. That was a big <laughs> drop. Freed up a lot of bucks. <clears throat> the second thing that it did, and this is the important thing for the savings and loan uh, industry, is it changed the way depreciation worked. Now, when you, when you buy commercial property, you're allowed to depreciate that property over the uh, average length of uh, uh, existence of that property. So, for example, if you buy a building uh, for a uh, million dollars and it's got a 20-year life, let's say, then you can depreciate the value of that property 5% every year for 20 years. Okay, which means that you can write that off your taxes. You take it off the gross, your gross income. Well, the Tax Reform Act of 1981 allowed for accelerated depreciation. So, in, instead of 5% every year for 20 years, you could write off 12% the first year, 10% the second year, 8% the third year. So in three years, you've dropped 30% instead of 15%. Okay? Now, what that meant was that you could get an enormous tax break. In fact, most of the people who invested went back and refigured their taxes th uh, three years in advance and took tax breaks on that too. So they made a fortune. So they're deferring tax payments, right? They're waiting to the future to pay the taxes on it and they're getting their deep discounts early on. Is that the way it works? Well, uh, when you're allowed to depreciate the value of the property, uh, it means that, uh, yeah, you pay less tax at the beginning and more tax right. later on. Right, okay, okay, okay. So it's deferring the tax. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. Um, of course, they all plan to sell the, the properties after three or four years. So they wouldn't pay so any they wouldn't taxes. Have to pay any, right, exactly. Right. Uh, so what this did was everybody wanted to build. Everybody <laughs> wanted to develop, right? <laughs> So, all, as you were saying, all of that development, all of those properties uh, were not built to 
put uh, people in their offices. To meet needs that no, people were no demanding. Demand. There was no right. market demand whatsoever. Right. It was a place to put your money, and it was an enormous tax shelter. Right. Okay. Uh, now, this is going to come back to haunt people. Okay. Now, there were some other changes. There were uh, changes in the uh, appraiser's laws. Uh, one key one was uh, something that always troubled me was uh, in 1983 and 1984 here in Austin, uh, along uh, Congress Avenue, our main avenue, uh, all these office towers went up all at once. Mm -hmm. You guys ever notice that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it always bothered me. I mean, why was everybody building at once? And all like postmodern style. Too. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, the reason was that the rules for appraisers were changed. Now, normally, if you put up a, a property, uh, the appraiser would have to take into account the surrounding properties. So in other words, if you put up a luxury apartment building on a block with four other luxury apartment buildings, it's worth less than if it sits by itself. Right? Naturally, market value. Well, under the new appraisal laws, appraisers did not have to take into account any building in the area that was under construction. So in other words, when they appraised one of those towers on Congress Ave, they didn't have to take into account the fact that there were five other towers being built right on the same street within a few blocks. Okay, so that the market value was uh, completely inflated for all of those towers. Okay, now you couple that with the fact that uh, you could loan on appraised values and I mean you had an inflation that uh, went through the roof. Uh, and people began to do things called land flipping, mm. uh, where uh, they would buy a property. I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a guy uh, named Lou Reese, Louis Reese from Dallas. He was a uh, developer. And uh, in 1983, he bought a property in uh, DeSoto, a town just south of Dallas, a uh, 223-acre tract for $5.3 million. A year later, he set up a partnership with a guy from Holland, and he sold the property to himself and the partner for $10 million. A year after that, that partnership sold the property back to another Reese company. He sold it back to himself for $15 million. Now, what's the point of this? I'm not sure I understand the financial benefit accrued from doing this land flipping. Well, he would borrow the money from a bank to uh, sell the property from himself to himself. So he would take the profit himself. Exactly. Okay. Okay, and, and the way he would do it is he'd get an appraiser to appraise the land at a higher value each time. <laughs> so. And this was called land flipping, and it was very common. Um, in fact, one developer told the story of being in a courthouse, a county courthouse uh, near Dallas, one afternoon, and a very real prime piece of property was up for sale. And what they did was they lined a hallway in front of the county clerk's office with card tables. You ever hear this story? No. This is incredible. <laughs> with card tables, okay? So the deed comes and sits on the first card table. Here's the buyer, here's the seller. They sign everything, pass papers, all the checks. But then they pass the deed to the next card table. New buyer. Uh, same property. Sa same property. Right. And they pass it down this line and it would go up every each time each time the value would rise okay now, okay now where where was the money uh where was the money coming in to to do this i mean well, wasn't there a yeah that's right each buyer had to borrow. Had, 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 had it borrowed from a savings and loan. So this Previously. is what increases the That's debt. Right. So every time they do this, they put in their pocket the profit, but they increase the debt. That's exactly By right. borrowing from the SNLs or whoever to finance these uh, actions. That's so the right. debt grows. It doubles every time they, you know, double the price That's right. of this thing. So this is how the debt doubles and skyrocks. It's That's exactly control. right. That's how all okay. of these, these uh, inflated values took place. Now, each, each borrower would have its own appraisal and it would have its own idea for the property. Okay, so if we're going to build the Taj Mahal, somebody might want to paint it. Somebody else might want to put mosaics this big. Well, that's going to cost you more. Okay. So, uh, all of this development was like the figment of people's imagination. Now, uh, at the same time, in the early 80s, 
Congress passed a law that said that savings and loans could go use new accounting procedures. Here's another change in the associated industry. The accountants, uh, the way it worked was, uh, let's say you uh, had a piece of property and you sold it and there was a $20,000 loss just for fun. It never happened in those days. But, <laughs> yeah. but let's say there was a $20,000 loss. Today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the old days, before uh, these new accounting procedures were put in, uh, you had to say minus 20000 and subtract it out of, what you have, of your net worth. Well, uh, these new accounting changes allowed you to spread that loss over 20 years. So you could divide it. So you lose 20000 you spread it over 20, 000, uh, 20 years, you subtract $1,000 each year. So even though you took the hit, in, uh, in 1983, for example, it never showed up on the books. So it was it's like deferring the taxes, it's deferring the losses. Exactly. And so the books looked great. I mean, you lose a thousand bucks, so what? So God, so the whole thing's a fairy tale then. I exactly. Mean, so it's like fantasy finance, the and whole it's fictive capital. <laughs> exactly. The whole thing was made up. Okay? It was, a, it was a daydream. It's now our nightmare, but it was a daydream then. Now, at the same time, Remember, uh, and by the way, the accountants were also uh, following uh, the same uh, pattern as the appraisers. The accountants were supposed to be independent auditors that went in and looked at the books, okay? But remember, they weren't being paid a fortune to do it. And so, uh, I mean, one of the prime examples, for example, is uh, Keating. His parent company uh, was called um, ACC, American mm -hmm. Continental. Uh, he went to Arthur Young in 1986, <laughs> yeah. and uh, now they they were making about 20 million dollars a year gross. Keating goes to him and says, "I've got a three million dollar account here, and I want you guys to cooperate." <laughs> well, naturally, they're going to cooperate. They're going to do what he tells them to do. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And of course, two years later, the guy who was in charge of that account suddenly left his job at Arthur Young and took a job with Keating for a million dollars a year. I yeah. mean, you know. Joining all of Keating's uh, siblings who were getting over a million a year exactly. for salaries. Exactly. So, now, the other uh, factor was the bank board itself. Now, the way the savings and loan industry was arranged uh, was uh, the federal overseer of all of the savings and loans was called uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. They had an office in Washington and then they had 12 regional offices. And they had a dual function. They were there to support the savings and loan industry. For example, uh, each of the 12 offices had a bank, a regional bank. And they would uh, lend savings and loans in their jurisdiction money if they needed it. They would support them in various ways. And they would promote them. Uh, they would help uh, with uh, advertising and all kinds of uh, stuff. But at the same time, they were the regulators. So, I mean, they had this dual schizophrenic role to play. And for most of the time the savings and loans existed, the first 40 years, there was no problem because they were mom and pop industry. Everybody was pretty honest. Nobody was making a killing anyway. But when these other changes started to take place and, and things started to explode, nobody changed the regulatory structure. So there was this intense coziness, okay, between the regulators, <coughs> the examiners, and the banks themselves. Let me give you an example. <laughs> uh, right here at the University of Texas at Austin, um, there's a gentleman whose name is uh, Robert Metlin. Now, Metlin is an expert in the world of thrift finance. Okay, that's his field. And apparently he's quite good at it. From 1983 to 1985, he sat on the board of directors of Lamar Savings. The biggest uh, SNL in town. Right, exactly. Uh, also the biggest uh, bailout in town. <laughs> but that's held our story. alternative views account. <laughs> <laughs> as well as my house. <laughs> well, you'll be very interested in this. So, Madeline was on the board of directors of Lamar Savings. He was also on the board of directors of Lamar Financial Corporation, which was the holding company that owned Lamar Savings. Hmm. Um, he, he was also at the very same time, from 1982 to 1987, the head of the regional bank board. 
How mean. So he was the head bank examiner responsible for Lamar Savings. At the same time he was on their board yeah, and, and, and both and boards. Both uh -huh. boards and, and was in nineteen eighty four he was named the uh, Lamar Savings Centennial Professor of uh, Savings and Loan Finance at the University of Texas. Which means, uh, is that an endowed chair? Yes. Which means he gets a hell of a lot of money for teaching over and above what professors normally right. get. Exactly, and that, so that of course that payout. endowment came from uh, Lamar Savings. Right. Right. And at nice, the same uh, time... Nice circle here, huh? Oh, well it gets better. He was also <laughs> on the Austin uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, which was of course uh, regulating or in uh, promoting all this growth mm -hmm. and he was the uh, University of Texas vice president uh, for uh, development that was also promoting growth and development exactly mm -hmm. so with certain savings and loans and corporate <laughs> <laughs> finance yeah. need we say more I mean uh, you know uh, cozy I guess is uh, hardly conveys the kind of conflict we're talking about. Right. Well, it's just a typical inside game of most regulatory agencies and their clients. Uh-huh, exactly. But uh, this is just a little little more egregious. Thing. There, there <laughs> is a, a difference here, though. I think the philosophical underpinnings of all this is the Reaganite philosophy of deregulation. Let the market solve all the problems, be it banking or development or savings and loan or whatever. So this is really the major example of Reagan's deregulation running amok pretty early on. Early on, the um, Garn Saint-Germain was touted as the triumph of the Reagan revolution, of the deregulatory policies being extended to um, the whole realm of finance. Well, that's true, but mm -hmm. you say the realm of finance, and remember, one of the key, the, the underpinnings of finance is the notion of risk. Mm -hmm. And there was no free market here. There was no free market at all because all of that money was guaranteed. Was guaranteed. Right. So it was a joke. Right. It was a myth. So it was socialism for the uh, gamblers for the and rich. the market um, yeah. for the players. Well, it was, they, no they were just, it was right. just counterfeit. They were just uh, legal counterfeiters right. Right. without right. restraint. So what so was happening here is that the government was, uh, was opening all the doors come in, let them by the hand, open the cookie oh, jar, right. and say, hey, uh, we're going to leave here now, and you folks uh, can Yeah, now, fun. don't you dare <laughs> touch that cookie jar. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you <laughs> screw up and uh, spoil all the cookies, we'll give you another we'll give batch. you more cookies. Yeah, yeah. exactly. we got plenty in the back. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just to, what really happened was, now, at the same time, mm. of course, all the thrifts are, uh, are uh, pulling in deposits from all over the country. The insurance is, uh, insured deposits at 100000 these $100,000 CDs, brokered deposits from all over. Uh, so the money's pouring in. The thrifts are pouring it out. Okay? They're uh, uh, paying developers who are overcharging them, who are paying architects, appraisers who are overcharging, who are contractors who are overcharging. Everybody's skimming. Everybody's taking their little Tight. piece of the action. Okay? So, the boom is well underway. Everything's going fine. Now, they've got to pay high interest rates on these deposits to attract them, right. and that's taken a big cut. Uh, what's probably taken a bigger cut is the, the lifestyle. I mean, they, they built these office towers. Uh, they had to buy planes because they had to fly over these tracts of land to look at them, and they're doing deals all over the country now. Uh, Limousines to take them to the airport. Well, exactly. They had uh, all of these. Call uh, girls to entertain their clients. Sig exactly. Promotional parties. Uh, Ed McBurney spent a million bucks on uh, three parties. Uh, uh, you know, 6% loan origination fees. Uh, you know, mm. you're, you're bringing in a lot of bucks. You get used to driving a Mercedes. Uh, you get tired of the Mercedes. You buy yourself a Lamborghini uh, and so forth. Well, this doesn't sound like mom and pop anymore. Uh, uh, exactly. Who used to own the SNLs? What we do is this whole new stratum of scumbags and charlatans move into the SNL industry exactly. and take it over. In fact, there was a big split in the industry right uh, that, that took place during this. Uh, several of the old timers who had owned savings and loans for years refused to play, and they just kept doing the same thing they'd been doing. Uh, they were laughed at by the high flyers who said, man, we're, everybody's making a killing, let's go. Uh, but they refused. And in fact, uh, there was a, uh, almost a, um, like a little secession 
Now, there was a secession, in a sense, from the uh, U.S. League of Saving Institutions, which was the main organization, oh. national organization. Several of these uh, more conservative thrifts dropped out. And in fact, uh, there are about 1,500 healthy thrifts left in the country. Most of them are those that... Uh, Didn't play the game. Exactly, stayed conservative. Oh. So there might be a lesson there somewhere. Now, we got the book going and then all of a sudden a bunch of forces began to converge as we've said these high interest rates they were paying uh, the high flying living high cost, high cost of living um, in 1985 oil prices dropped mm -hmm. been up to thirty dollars a barrel suddenly dropped to eleven okay so r right away several of the developers and investors who were uh, putting together these enormous projects that the savings and loans were funding, defaulted. Okay. Now, that started the slide. This is around 86? This is 85. 85, 86, 85. 85. Okay. Okay. In 86 came the big hit. Okay, and the big hit was the second Tax Reform Act of the Reagan years, in which he reneged on all of the deals of the first tax reform act so in other words accelerated depreciation retroactively cut off retroactively retroactively suddenly they had to refigure all the taxes back on a uh, a straight line uh, life of uh, of the uh, asset <laughs> basis. They say, hey, okay, I want my cookies back. They say, wait a minute, they flushed down. I mean, they're in That's right. down the Arkansas That's River. Right. Right. And so ago. all of these people <laughs> who had taken this enormous tax break suddenly had to make it up. Had to make it up. And so they all, I mean, almost 100% defaulted on their deals. They couldn't make any payments. Uh, the escrow accounts uh, that were set up as the original part of the deal were running out. And all of these deals fell apart. Now, the developers were in another serious bind because when a property was foreclosed, the, uh, and if the SNL forgave the debt mm -hmm. and didn't chase you, uh, the IRS treated that forgive, f forgiven debt as income. <laughs> okay, so if you were forgiven a seven hundred thousand dollar debt, then they sent a little form to the IRS, and the IRS said, "Well, you owe us taxes on seven hundred thousand dollars." Plus, any depreciation that they did get from the now straight line depreciation uh, was treated as a capital gains. So they had to pay capital gains tax on what they had written off. <laughs> So everybody declared bankruptcy. I mean, it's a joke now, but if you look at the, the curves by year of bankruptcies in Texas, it goes, and then boom, like that. Mm. Uh, and that's the reason. I mean, they just had no choice. So now <laughs> the dream is over. The party's over. The party is over. And the hangover is very heavy. <laughs> that's right. And so all the savings and loans now have to foreclose. Now, when they foreclose, uh, in most of these deals, the property was set up as collateral. So now all the savings and loans suddenly are taking in all this property. Now they're taking in apartment buildings, they're taking in developments that have a few roads in them, and they got the golf course up. <laughs> you know. But no uh, people but living there. There's nothing there. Right. Yeah. Empty office buildings, they got nothing. Now, this is. Uh, these foreclosed properties are called real estate dash owned on the books of the, of the, the banks. So they're sh uh, known as REO property for short. REO was a real problem for banks, savings and loans. Because, first of all, they had to take care of them. I mean, you got an apartment building, somebody's got to manage it, somebody's got to get the rent, somebody's got to clean them up, maintenance, all of that. They got to pay taxes. If you got a development that was half finished, you had to finish it. And uh, suddenly, they were in the serious development business, and they didn't want to be. So, that was the first problem. The second problem was that REO was subject to regulatory write-down. Okay, now, what does that mean? Well, the regulators would come in and they'd look at the REO that you had on your books. 
if you were carrying, you know, they were supposed to be trying to sell us to get back their investment. If you couldn't sell it, the regulators would come in and actually arbitrarily drop the value. Yeah. Well, which was realistic, though. Exactly, because it wasn't selling. Or it wasn't even developed in some cases. Yeah, that's and right. they didn't have the capital to complete the project. That's right, but you can see what this did to the banks, to the, to the savings and loan. Right? The, the profits go down. No more yeah. bonuses based on profits. Uh, their capital reserve go down. Now they're technically insolvent. And the regulators are banging on the door. They're going to close them. Uh, in one case, I'll give you an exam another example from Lamar here in town. Uh, they had a development out on Route 2222, it's out west of town here. Uh, enormous development, golf course, a little uh, water company made water. <laughs> um, 1,200 homes, many of them in the high dollar bracket. Um, it was called River Place. Well, they sank $63 million into River Place. When they foreclosed on it, they got, uh, uh, I think, 100 homes, the golf course, and the water company, and the land the roads. Um, over time, the regulators wrote it down, and the eventual final write-down value was $5 million. So on that one deal, Lamar lost, gone forever, $58 million. Which was actually in the pockets of all the people to start out with. That's right. Uh, the, uh, the the bank people and the construction people, people all that. developers, but now it's the appraisers, everybody who skimmed some of the action. So the money is gone, but it's gone somewhere else in that's their right. pockets or in offshore banks or that's right. CIA or mafia. And or the whole thing. Be. Remember that the whole value was <clears throat> originally inflated yeah. by those appraised values by by all of that. So REO property was an enormous problem for the SNLs. And this is where the owners, the executives, stepped over the line. Okay, now they've been living the high life for a few years. Legally, huh? Legally, originally. Right. Okay, even though we know it's a figment of their imagination, it was legal. But now, they got all this REO, and they got to get it off their books. So, they developed some schemes to get it off their books. One thing they did, for example, was a simple deal called a sham transaction. You got a friend? Okay. Uh, you were the owner of the bank. You sell uh, apartment buildings to your friend. And you write into the deal, you will not be held responsible uh, for this loan if uh, you have to foreclose. And they'd put in the interest and all that. And, uh, you know, you'd be allowed to take a couple hundred thousand dollars out of the operating expenses or you'd, you'd get your money somehow. Okay. Now, what this did was it took the REO off the books, gave it to you while I'm looking for a buyer. But I didn't have any responsibility because in the contract you said if I defaulted, I wouldn't be held exactly. liable. Exactly. Exactly. There was a case here in town, yeah. for example, another Lamar case. The owner uh, had a friend named, uh, an Indian guy named Vijay Parikh. And uh, there was an apartment building here in town that was REO. And Lamar sold the building to Vijay Parikh. And during the trial, he was tried and convicted of uh, fraud. During the trial, it came out that Parikh didn't know how much the loan was that he was getting, what the interest rate was, what the payments were. I mean, he just didn't know anything. They just, they just gave him the money to take the, th to take the thing off, the, off their hands. Right, basically. and of course, no money really exchanged hands. Yeah. They just said, uh, the apartment building's in your name, and you just borrowed you know, the worth of the apartment building from us. Oh. Right. And it's up to him to develop it and to run it. Yeah, cetera. exactly. And he held it for six months or so. And actually, he was actually a pretty good property manager, apparently. And then uh, a buyer was found and it was sold. He didn't even know the name of the buyer, by the way, when it happened. Mm -hmm. He sold his own property. He didn't know who it was sold to. It was all done by Lamar. Yeah. 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 So this was just a way to hide, get it off the books. And, yeah. Uh, so these are the kinds of transactions that most of the indictments that you read about in the papers are uh, focused on. This is after 86 or 86 right. and after? 86 and after was okay. most, 85, 86, where right. most of these deals went down. Well, what about some of these things that they did that you told in a previous program where SNLs would sell their bad assets to another SNL when they knew the bank examiners were coming in? Exactly. And then when the bank examiner left, then that SNL would sell them back to the original uh, uh, SNL. 
Those were called daisy chains. Yeah. Now, and this was the same problem. Are those legal or are those illegal? Oh, they're illegal yeah. because it's, it's a means of hiding the true yeah. worth of the bank from the regulators. So they so, had a whole bunch of these schemes. Exactly. Yeah, scams. But they were all focused around this REO, which happened after 86 and 85 when mm -hmm. oil prices dropped and, more importantly, when the other tax, the second tax reform act came through. Mm -hmm. and, and effectively uh, uh, cut the legs off of the, the industry. Well, I just wanted to, to clear up a couple of other uh, kinds of deals that you may read oh, okay. about. Okay, there was one, uh, we've already talked about uh, daisy chains, mm -hmm. and uh, if it was just two uh, savings and loans, it was called trading a dead horse for a dead cow. <laughs> <laughs> you, you take my dead cow, I'll take your dead horse. Yeah. Um, there was also a kind of transaction called cash for trash <laughs> okay and this has become uh, quite important and it's is uh, is the thing that they're uh, after Silverado about sound like a TV program then mm -hmm. exactly <laughs> well it's sort of the way it works bad game show <laughs> it was, yeah. that's what it was like because here was the deal if a developer came to the bank and said I need uh, uh, 50 million dollars to develop uh, this development the bank would say fine we'll loan you 50 million but actually we want to loan you 60 million and you take that extra 10 million and you use it to buy some REO from us so it was another way to get REO off the books now remember I was telling you about this uh, land flip up in Dallas with Lou Reese who yeah. 5.3 million he sold it to himself a couple times 10 15 right well in 1985 uh, Lamar Savings uh, contracted with Lou Reese to buy the property from himself again, this time for twenty-eight and a half million dollars. Okay, two years before he paid five point three for it. But they loaned him thirty-seven million dollars. <clears throat> now the extra was transferred to another company that Lu Reese owned, and that company used that money as down payment for two shopping centers that Lamar owned, that they had to foreclose on. Exactly. So that's playing an inside game of um, circulating your bad investments. Exactly. So once again, another trick to get REO off your books. And was this illegal? This was very illegal. And in fact, uh, uh, four Lamar executives have, uh, were indicted uh, two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, this was one of the uh, transactions that was in, named in the. Industry. And what about Eddie Reese? Ultimately, did his development Look. projects flop? I think I saw something on TV about that. Uh -huh. Well, he says that uh, he took the 28 million and he put it into developing this property, this DeSoto property, uh, and he had a deal with Lamar that six months later, once he had the structural things in, that they would lend him more money to build the homes and so forth, and. Um, uh, he claims that when he went back to Lamar uh, to get more money, they reneged and said they weren't going to give him any more. Lamar says that they weren't going to give him any more because he pocketed 10 of the $28 million. <laughs> Which, of course, he did. <laughs> I mean, what would you do? Um, so, REO is the problem. Now, there was a bank in Denver, Colorado that's gotten quite famous, uh, called Silverado. And one of the reasons they're famous is they had a nifty creative way to get rid of REO. Um, now, of course, this is the one where Neil Bush is on the board. Uh, and in fact, Silverado is kind of a classic example of uh, many of these things that we've talked about. Uh, they use these uh, structural changes uh, to uh, build Silverado into uh, an enormous dream. Uh, when the bubble burst, uh, they, just like everyone else, had all this REO property. What they did was they set up a little holding company off to the side, and they dumped all their REO in the holding company. Now, this was called the loan pool. And then, when developers came to them, they loaned them much more than the asking, than developers asked for, and the developers would then buy stock in the loan pool. With the extra money. With the extra money. That would keep the uh, bad investments circulating. Look, yeah, and looking great. Right. So they put these, all these profits on their books. I see. Now, Silverado was notorious. They, they had, at every time they had been examined, 
they had been uh, warned and cited for uh, excessive uh, bonuses, excessive salaries, uh, insider loans. Michael Wise was the chairman. He, uh, Silverado loaned him two and a half million dollars on which he defaulted. The major stockholder was a guy named Metz. They loaned him one and a half million and he defaulted. Uh, Neil Bush's company's got millions of dollars. Exactly, and they got millions of dollars from two developers that did many of these deals with Silverado, uh, Ken Good and Bill Walters. Uh, and in fact, uh, the indictment or the charges against Neil Bush uh, are focused on specific transactions involving those two guys. And they, of course, had helped him set up his uh, oil exploration company. In, so uh, he was loaning to his <clears throat> business partners. Exactly. He had a conflict of interest because he was on the blank bank board. <laughs> exactly. Now, it's funny you, you, uh, because uh, I'm, I'm laughing because uh, during his testimony before uh, Henry Gonzalez's banking committee, uh, he was trying to explain his relationship with Bill Walters. And uh, Frank Anunzio said, uh, so uh, uh, your partner was borrowing money from uh, the bank and you were approving the loans and uh, and Bush said no 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 Walters was a partner in my company but I wasn't a partner with him <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Frank Annunzio uh, uh, representative Annunzio oh, calls geez. this the principle of partneris interruptus <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like uh, Neil Bush you make a good vice president uh, well, I'm sure he had the, uh, the advice of his dad, who was uh, considered an expert in this field. He headed the, uh, uh -huh. yeah, he headed, uh, the White House task force to oversee deregulation of the SNL industry. And Edwin Gray. That sounds to me like the oh, worst person possible to get financial uh, advice exactly. from. Exactly. Because this is such a disaster, this whole apparatus. That's right. But see, in 1983-84... It appeared that George, Bush was on top of things. Well, and he studied the industry very carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Edwin Gray, who was on the committee with him, said that in, in testimony before Congress, he said that he was delighted to serve with Vice President Bush because Bush was so knowledgeable about the savings and loan industry. Okay. Now, in 85, 86 was when the legs got cut out, and that's when Neil Bush went on the board in 1985. So his timing was bad. Yeah, uh, one could say that. <laughs> now, there's some other things about Silverado. You know, in 1987, they, they were subject to a, a big examination, and the examiners recommended that it be closed. Uh, a guy named Kermit Mowbray, who was the head of the regional bank board and who was the one to issue the order, uh, declined to do so and said, uh, they're good guys down there, let's work it out with them. Hmm. And so, they were allowed to stay in business for another year. And in the summer of 88, they were told that they had to come up with $62 million in cash by October 13th or they were going to be closed. Now, it was right around this time that Neil Bush resigned because his dad had been nominated for, uh, to run for president of the Republican Party. Uh, interestingly enough, on October 13th, when the day that they were supposed to uh, close Silverado, actually on October 12th, Kermit Mowbray, who was supposed to issue the order, got a mysterious phone call, you can't remember from whom, <laughs> from Washington, that said, delay the closing of Silverado. And so, Silverado was not closed until November 9th, one day. Before Election. One day after the election. Or after the election, so that it couldn't become part of the election. Exactly. Exactly. Now, uh, total cost to the taxpayer? Hard to tell. One and a half billion, probably, for uh, Silverado. Silverado alone. Uh -huh. uh, five uh, executives have been barred from uh, the industry for life, and uh, charges are going to be brought against uh, Neil Bush. He could have uh, accepted a deal, but he chose to fight. Uh, and it appears that uh, the 
uh, Office of Thrift Supervision is now going to seek a $200 million uh, lawsuit against uh, the board, including Neil Bush. All over Washington, there's posters, Jail Neil Bush. I was in Washington, D.C. <laughs> last week. So this is a very big issue there. But I think there's scapegoating him. He was just one of hundreds, maybe thousands, exactly. of wheelers and dealers who were playing these games. And everything I've read about Bush, he was uh, pretty light in the head. I mean, he wasn't very intelligent. He was just getting sort of suckered into these things. Well, I that mean, Michael Weiss pulled him into Silverado, obviously, for his name yeah, well, and his political connections. It wasn't that Bush had any expertise or that he even knew what he was doing. Well, uh, he had uh, some experience in banks. He had been a clerk in a bank as a summer job when he was in college. <laughs> because it's New York. So, so that's that the of his experience. That, that right. qualified him to be on the board. Yeah. Uh -huh. right. But, you know, he knew Walters and Good. They'd invested in his, in his company. Mm -hmm. Wise, Walters, and uh, their common lawyer, they all shared a lawyer, were all members of the Chamber of Commerce at the same time. Uh, I mean, they were just all cozy little friends. Now, know, what's the, together. Rob, what's the complicity of uh, Congress in all of this? So far, we've seen that the Reagan deregulation and just stupid banking rules gone amok caused the problem in the first place, which was compounded by the change in the tax laws that made the situation worse, that you didn't know what the game rules were anymore. Now, Congress is supposed to have some responsibility. Well, they did. I mean, this. first of all, they, they passed the, ta the two tax reform acts, for one thing, right. and, uh, and, and the Garn Saint Germain, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the uh, ca leave, lifting off the cap on deposits. They approved the uh, so changes in accounting procedures. Uh, Edwin Gray went to Congress. He testified before several congressional committees in 1984 and 1985. He warned this was going to happen. He said there's going to be an enormous taxpayer bailout. You guys are being crazy. He put in regulations. Uh, Congress uh, gutted those regulations. So Congress is... And Congress things. got rid of Gray. Right. Exactly. Uh, they yeah, refused they to renew him. him. Yeah. He was the only honest guy in the whole... And they brought in a crony insider in the industry. Danny Wall. Danny Wall. We start this program by talking about the Southwest Plan, which was hatched up by Danny Wall, who had been the replacement for Edwin Gray as head of the bank board. The infamous Southwest Plan, which was uh, an enormous giveaway. Uh, How'd that work? Well... Uh, after 86-87, uh, when uh, the industry was falling apart, uh, the bank board was going in and taking over all of these insolvent thrifts. I mean, they were, they, they were losing money daily. Ten million dollars a day was pouring out. So uh, it behooved the industry to take over these thrifts. But when they did, they had to pay off the deposits. And they had to pay off the interest and so forth. Now, the According to the charter of the FSLIC, the insurance corporation, all thrifts paid uh, insurance premiums into a pool. And that pool was rapidly depleted. In 1987, a, uh, a boost to that pool was passed through Congress uh, of $11 billion. Where the federal government just put the money into uh, the They hopper. loaned it to the, right. in, uh, to the FSLIC. Okay. Uh, and by the way, uh, Jim Wright resigned over machinations of this $11 million. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. And Coelho also resigned this because he was compromised by the SNL uh -huh. in California. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right, with uh, Columbia Savings. Mm -hmm. And he, he was also a good friend of Mike Milkins. But again, yeah. that's another story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, with the uh, bank board taking over all these thrifts, all the money disappeared real fast. Now it's 1988. There are 197 losing savings and loans in the Southwest, mainly in Texas. They're hemorrhaging money out. It's, uh, um, and the insurance fund is broke. So Danny Wall, who's now the head of the bank board, decides that what he's going to do is work out a deal with wealthy capitalists around the country to buy up these banks so that the bank board won't have to take them over. So he's got to convince these guys to buy these losing propositions. Okay, so here's what he did. First of all, he packaged them up, uh, you know, 10 here, 20 here. 
and uh, he went to these uh, wealthy folks, Robert Bass, one of the Hunts, uh, a guy named uh, Perlman, Ronald Perlman, who's head of Revlon Corporation, and uh, James Fail, who we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, all of the deals, although many of them are still secret, uh, they all, as far as we can tell, shared some common characteristics. And here's the way they went down. Um, the bank board would go to the investor with a list of the assets. Uh, the investor would choose the assets that he would take responsibility for. Obviously, the performing loans, the, the ones that were worth a lot of money and so forth. All of the bad assets, the defaulted loans, the REO that was no good, uh, and so forth, he still owned because the bank board couldn't take it. They didn't have any organization or any money to do it. But bank board said, we will guarantee those. So if you've got a non-performing loan, don't worry about it. We'll pay it. And we'll give you a promissory note right here from the federal government. <laughs> okay? For 10 years, we'll pay off all of those bad assets. It's a good insurance policy. Wow. You know what the investors, or the uh, potential investors said? No deal. We want to make some profit on our money. Danny Wall said, no sweat. <laughs> we'll give you 2% profit on everything. All the bad assets. We'll not only pay them off, we'll give you 2%. The guy said, well, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I've got to uh, chase these people. I've got to hire lawyers. I've got to litigate this stuff. No problem. We'll pay the lawyers' fees, whether they're successful or not. We being the federal government. The federal government, that's right. And how much money did he have to do these things? Well, and he, where did he get it? Well, he didn't get it. Mm -hmm. he, he all he had to do was write, write notes. checks. I owe you. Yeah. I owe you. <laughs> well, the original value of the notes, and of course, there were very optimistic expectations about some of these people picking up payments even though they hadn't paid for two years and this kind of stuff. And so the estimate by the bank board at the time was $24.5 million to close these, sh these thrifts or to sell them. Um, right now, it's close to $50 billion. And most experts uh, give a range of 75 to 100 billion for just this. These uh, there were 15 transactions. And this is just in the Southwest. The Southwest. Plan. Right. It's called the Southwest Plan. Now. And that's what they were saying. The entire bailout bill was going to be uh, a few months ago. Exactly. <laughs> now, now catch this. <laughs> One guy who's been in the news uh, quite a bit lately is a guy named James Fail. Now he's oh, a yeah. uh -huh, he's a uh, an insurance guy. He's had insurance companies, and um, in 1976, one of his companies was convicted of a felony fraud, and he was indicted. But he copped a plea and got out of it. But he was barred from selling insurance in the state of Alabama. He's also been barred from several other states for various malpractices. <laughs> <laughs> so. He comes along and he buys, as part of the Southwest plan, 15 failed savings and loans. He packages them together, calls it Blue Bonnet Savings, and he goes into business. Well, how did they let him do that if he was such a bad guy? Well, that's funny you would mention that. <laughs> uh, he hired a lobbyist, <laughs> a guy named uh, Robert Thompson. Now, Thompson is an interesting guy because he's a close friend of Prescott Bush Jr., George Bush's brother. And in fact, in 1979, this lobbyist Thompson was actually on uh, George Bush's uh, campaign staff when he was going for presidency. And in 1980, when Bush became vice president, uh, Thompson became a legislative aide, a liaison between Congress and the White House. So he got to know everybody. And in 1983, he quits his job and he goes into the lobbying business. And he, the first thing he does, he sends out promotional uh, flyers on Thompson and Company uh, stationery that says uh, he has breakfast once a month with George Bush. So he had a successful lobbying business. So in 1988, James Fail comes along and says, I want a piece of the Southwest Plan action. Can you help me? And the guy says, no problem, Thompson. And Thompson takes all of the documents through the approval process where they're supposed mm -hmm. to look and see if yeah. these guys have been right. felons and whatever and uh, some of the forms disappear <laughs> and they, they, they boxes don't get checked right and son of a gun fail ends up with blue bonnet savings now blue bonnet savings has three million three billion dollars in total assets okay 1.85 
is guaranteed those promissory notes from the government. Okay. Now, Fail paid $70 million to get into that deal. So he got $3 billion for an initial, he had to put in his own capital, $70 million. Well, that $70 million he borrowed, some of it from his own insurance company. What he actually put up out of his own pocket was $1,000. He got thirty billion in assets. Three, three, three billion. billion for a thousand dollars. I would have given him twenty five hundred. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why didn't they talk to me? So, interestingly enough, in nineteen eighty nine, just to finish the story, Blue Bonnet Savings was the single most successful, most profitable thrift. Now, thrifts are there to make loans. Guess how many loans Blue Bonnet Savings made in nineteen eighty nine? Thousands. Four. Four big ones. <laughs> Four. Four loans. One of, uh, three of which I don't know about. One was to a lobbyist named Robert Thompson. $350,000. Oh. No kidding. So, uh, Phil got his, his banks, even though he wasn't eligible because of his previous uh, history. Thompson got his payoff. Thompson got his payoff. Payoff. Plus, he got 2% of uh, the uh, profits from Blue Bonnet in the first several years. Uh, uh, the, 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 the lobbyist. The lobbyist. lobbyist yeah, two percent. Now, is Thompson in jail yet? <laughs> no. Hey, what are you kidding? He's a good friend of Prescott Bush. Well, he how has did, breakfast with George Bush every month. Every uh, month. How, how did he get the two percent of the profits? That was just part of the that deal. That was part of the deal. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It took two percent. So. That's the Southwest plan. And that's considered to be one of the most egregious offenses uh, in this whole nasty story. And uh, this was, uh, this particular part came from the regulators. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was a Danny Wall arranged. Uh, well, the, the message of all this seems to be that every time Congress tries to do something to deal with this SNL crisis, they do something that makes things worse. And when the federal regulatory apparatus sticks their hand in the pie and they try to fix up, clean up the mess, they make it even worse. Has this been the accelerating story of the worsening of the crisis of the SNL? This is the way your story sounds to me. Exactly. Now, if you think about it, there are three real uh, strong players here. There's, okay. there's Congress right. and the legislative apparatus, including the White House. And then you've got the regulatory apparatus here. And then you've got the savings and loans. The players. The players. And if you listen to the, play, to the players and the SNLs, they're blaming the regulators. The regulators are blaming Congress. Congress is uh, blaming the uh, SNL guys. Sounds like there's yet, plenty of blame to go around exactly. for everybody. It's however, however uh, some of the regulators were in bed, of course, as we talked about, interlocked and in bed with the industry. But the good guys, the regulators who were taking their job seriously and were trying to keep things under control, like Edwin Gray, who was head of the bank board, Congress kicked him out. And the bank examiners in uh, California who were trying to to uh, make Keating toe the line with Lincoln Savings, they were stomped on by the uh, the, the boys higher Keating up. Five, right? Yeah, the five. Well, like Atlanta uh, uh, people were trying to investigate Florida and some of the problems down there, and they were given a hard time by both Congress and the people they were trying to investigate. Exactly, and it goes even further than that. Uh, Edwin Gray in 1984, when he realized he started to see what was going on. Uh, he said, first of all, they had slashed the budget of the regulators, slashed it by more than half over the previous few years. So he had minimal staff. It was two, three years before uh, they got back into a bank after an examination, between examinations, two, three years sometimes. And the salaries were incredibly low. All of the good people had been sucked out and gone into other organizations, like the FDIC, for example. And what they had was a bunch of people that uh, just got out of college and were looking for a job, you know, and they got something, 26000 a year, something like that. And they were the ones responsible for trying to figure all this stuff out. In fact, I was talking to one of the executives uh, at Lamar during this period, and he told me about a regulator. Now, this is a guy, you know, he's been in the business 20 years. 
And a regulator, 26 years old, comes in. He's got six months' experience. <laughs> he's sitting there, and he's going through these folders, and his eyes are crossing. And uh, the executive is is pointing things out and saying, hey, now, don't forget to look at this here and see this here. And uh, here's the list for due diligence over here. And, you know? So, uh, the, the, now, Gray went to... He was... His apparatus was controlled by OMB, the Office of Management and Budget. So Gray called David Stockman, who was in charge at the time, and he said, David, <laughs> help. I need more people. I need better salaries. I've got to have some money. And Stockman said, wait a minute. You mean you want more regulation? This is the era of deregulation. You want more regulation? That's tantamount to treason. And he wasn't kidding. They were talking. He treason. was an ideologue. He was a hardcore deregulation will solve all problems. Exactly. And and Ed Gray, for all his uh, goodness of spirit, was uh, derisively known in Washington as the great re-regulator. That was the label that mm -hmm. they they stuck on him. Because deregulation run amok. The situation uh, got nothing but worse. Uh, Bush comes into office and he presents a bailout package. This is 89 now. Early this is 89. 80, early 89. And One now of his first actions as president. Exactly. 28 days or something into his presidency. Uh, and a lot of the package was based in what he had learned in 1984 when he was head of the White House Task Force to oversee deregulation. And uh, they had proposals then that they chose not to present. But some of them were incorporated into... Uh, the bailout bill of last summer, which was called FIREA, uh, uh, the Federal Institution Recovery Reform and Enforcement Act. I mean, <laughs> you got to have an acronym, or exactly, that, uh, exactly. Is, you're not doing something the, important. The, the bureaucraties, <laughs> Bush bailout, is what I call it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, there was an interesting provision in the Bush bailout that uh, I want to bring up here. Now, remember, we had the Tax Reform Act of 1981 and then the Tax Reform Act of 1986 that reversed all of those changes and effectively cut the industry down. Now, in the bailout bill, there was a, there's a little clause that says goodwill is no longer valid. Okay. Now, goodwill was something that the bank board had offered during uh, the time when all the uh, when the SNLs were starting to crash, uh, again they were looking for ways to shore up insolvent SNLs without putting any money in, because uh, lots of during lots of that period there was no money in the insurance fund. So uh, the regulators worked out deals. If there was an insolvent thrift, let's say there was a thrift that had uh, was 50 million in the red, they would go to a nearby thrift and they would say. We want you to buy that bad thrift. And they'd say, well, that's crazy. Why should I do that? I'm going to lose 50 million bucks, and then I'm insolvent. <laughs> so the bank board said, no sweat. We, if you buy that thrift, we will give you something called goodwill, $50 million worth. You can put it on your books, and so your books will be balanced. And you'll help us out, and you'll get that other thrift, and uh, when the bank examiners come along, they have to add in this 50 million on the profit side, so that uh, you know your books aren't crashed by this insolvent savings and loan. So there were all these in institutions around the country who had bought up other insolvent thrifts to help out the bank board, and they had taken on goodwill in good faith. Now the bailout bill comes along in 1989. Now remember, the bailout bill was bailing out approximately 275 to maybe 300 badly insolvent thrifts, 50 billion dollars, right? Then, in the bailout bill, it says goodwill is no longer valid. So this thrift that had a 50 million dollar plus, suddenly it's gone, evaporated. <laughs> <laughs> and it's insolvent. Now they're insolvent. <laughs> and so if you remember, six months after the bailout bill, suddenly they announced that, oops, another 500 thrifts couldn't meet the capital requirements. They were going to go down. 
That's, That's why. why it was the damn good will. So it made it worse. So every time that there's a government action on this, it intensifies in a qualitative way. Uh, uh, mushroom in, ex in an exponential way. Exponential. Yeah, right. exactly. I mean, something like this is just. I mean, that's why at the beginning of the program I said something about uh, conspiracies. I mean, it's so obvious that you'd think that it's, it's intentional. I saw an article that the, in the Dallas newspaper that the regulators are wanting to renege on the Southwest plan and make that retroactive. Now, is this part of what you're talking about? Well, or is that something separate? It's a new development. Well, it's, it's a slightly new development. Part, um, part of this has to do with James Fail, the blue bonnet savings guy, because they're saying that he obtained his Southwest Plan deal fraudulently because the papers that were submitted weren't clear about his past history, which would have barred him from participating. So that's one aspect of uh, why they're going to renege on his deal. But in addition, what they're saying is you remember the deal was that all the bad assets that the investor, the buyer, chose not to take control of, the uh, government said they would guarantee. And uh, that agreement, those were called yield maintenance agreements. Hmm. They would maintain the yield on this loan even if it was defaulted on. Okay? So in other words, you've got a, you, you loan out some money, the guy defaults, he's not giving you any payments anymore and uh, uh, the investor fail has to, for example has to take that loan as part of the Southwest plan and the government said we'll make the payments See, oh. that's what the guarantee is we'll I make see. the payments we'll give you two percent profit and we'll pay your legal fees okay and we'll give you two percent profit on the legal fees <laughs> yeah okay don't forget that so what the government is saying now is that those agreements means that if effectually the government bought that loan and it belongs to the government okay so now they're going to say uh -huh. yeah all of those guaranteed uh, loans and all those guaranteed assets are ours wasn't that just as just as well with uh, guys like fail because they don't have those bad loans those non uh, or or is it bad because they're not getting the exactly the government uh, well, nipple the sock on. remember that Fails Blue Bonnet Savings was the most successful savings and loan, and the reason was yeah. that he got his first guaranteed payment from the government of $275 million. So that's why he didn't make any loans. He didn't have to. The government gave him $275, or $275 million to make up for those bad loans. Okay, so that's where the money's going. Yeah. The government's saying, wait a minute, we got the resolution trust now, we have a place to put things, and we're just going to take all that stuff back. And we're not going to pay uh -huh. you those guarantees anymore. Rob, what is the effect of this, of the government reneging on the Southwest plan going to be for other people like FAIL? That depends on the, the specifics of each of the deals. In other words, there were 15 transactions, okay, so 15 wealthy investors took over a total of 197 SNLs. Uh, some of them got incredible sweetheart deals. Here's an example, Ronald Perelman. Uh, he got to write off all of those bad assets that the government guaranteed even though the government was paying him for it and he was making a profit on them, <laughs> he got to write them off as a tax break. Oh he got a God. one and a half billion, billion dollar tax break, okay, on those savings and loans. Now, in addition, he got the government to agree. See, he wasn't making that much profit on those savings and loans. So he had more tax break on his savings and loan company, First Gibraltar, than he did on any of his other holding companies. So, he got the government to agree that he could float that tax break throughout his other holding companies. So if he made $500 million on this company back here, he'd just suck off $500 million tax break from the savings and loan side and dump it over here, and he wouldn't have to pay any tax on that company either. Okay? So now he's got a sweet hard deal.
at the expense of the uh, government and the taxpayers. Oh, exactly. I mean, the taxpayers are the ones who are getting money killed. Taken from the tax fund. Exactly. And that's where my checking account is. I'm going to withdraw my $230. <laughs> Ruin old Perlman. <laughs> now, uh, some of the other Southwest Plan deals have not been quite as successful. There's one uh, bought by a company called Lone Star Technologies. I'm not sure who's involved person you know, the names but uh, Lone Star and uh, they haven't been doing quite as well they didn't get the great tax break uh, they chose uh, they were a little more responsible they chose to take on take responsibility themselves for more of the assets and they haven't done quite as well so they actually lost money hmm. uh, so the, uh, the reports I read say that it depends on how well you negotiated your Southwest Southwest plan it oh. looks like fails is going to be uh, terminated. Um, the others, it will again. They'll have to renegotiate. Such a strange. This whole thing is strange. It's, all it's, these it's gambling. It's it's like sort of a gambling thing where the rules keep changing. Yeah, and there's and because the rules keep changing, and because uh, there's there's so much turmoil and so much money, those who are in the know make make big bucks and if you're a little slow if you're not right in the heart of it or you don't have the right connections i mean that's exactly. another thing you, you get killed i'll give you an example okay um first gibraltar was a big savings and loan in houston it was going down there were uh several stockholders major stockholders two of them were named robert strauss and ricky strauss oh Rob, they, Bob Strauss. The big guys in the Democratic, Democratic Party. Party. Right. Oh. Okay, now they were big stockholders in First Gibraltar. They were the, also the only two stockholders to sell off their stock and get their money out before First Gibraltar went down. Now, Robert Strauss is a partner in a law firm in Dallas called Aiken and Gump. Aiken and Gump was Ronald Perelman's law firm when he took over First Gibraltar. So, what I reconstruct is that First Gibraltar's in trouble, it's going to be part of the Southwest plan. Danny Wall goes to Ronald Perelman and says, hey, you got money, you want to take over these thrifts, and they negotiate. Well, Aiken and Gump is the law firm that helps those negotiations. Robert Strauss is a partner in Aiken and Gump, and he's a big stockholder in First Gibraltar. So he yanks his money out. Then they do the deal, everybody loses money except Strauss. Is there any way to estimate the extent of the financial disaster here, or is it, is it just changing so rapidly that it's really fictive? It's, it's, uh, it's changing rapidly, and the, one of the reasons is that uh, remember that a lot of this money was lost because of those that hyperinflated equity. It was an inflated equity. Now the bottom is dropping out of all of those projects, all of those developments, all of the loans, and so the appraised value, the market value of the assets that were loaned against keeps dropping, and so you lose more and more money. So we won't know until the real estate market drops or stops dropping until it bottoms up. So all the all the extra uh, amount that was as a result of all this land flipping, which was fictitious, yes. just fake uh, uh, value, is going down to where it should it be should started out with. Uh huh. But remember, we've got another problem now. All of these assets, enormous number of assets, are in the Resolution Trust Corporation. That's the bailout, right? So now, uh, the, the Wall Street Journal says that the Resolution Trust will do for real estate what uh, the silos did for the value of the price of corn in the Midwest. You remember we started uh, stockpiling grain mm -hmm. and subsidizing farms? So prices went way down. That's right. And it's controlled now. Effectively, the real estate market is controlled by the Resolution Trust Corporation. So there's not going to be much new construction because there's so much over exactly. construction now and prices are going down. But there's a catch here. This sounds like it's good for the consumer, for the house buyer. If the prices are going down, that means more people will be able to buy houses or office buildings. But the catch is they're having more trouble borrowing money for these houses or for buying development projects because of the tight restrictions now well, that's, on loans. That's exactly that, right. Is that correct? That's, that's exactly right. Hearing. There's some
we call the credit crunch. Uh, and part of this, uh, there are several parts to, to what you're talking about. First of all, remember that the banking industry, particularly the what's called the thrift industries, and although uh, there's some gone. question whether it's, it's going to survive, uh, has been concentrated. Once again, we have a concentration into fewer and fewer hands. So the thrift industry is no longer mom and pop, independent entities in each little town. Okay, for example, here in uh, Texas, NCNB is the big bank now. Enormous bank. What is it's from that? North Carolina. It's from, it's from North Carolina. Okay, so they come into Texas. Now, you've got somebody that uh, bought a house for $100,000. They took out an $80,000 note. Real estate prices are dropping. Now, their house is worth 60000 but they've got an $80,000 note. So, NCNB says, hey, wait a minute. I don't want to. Uh, I want to stop that deal. So they foreclose. They just say, "Hey, we we're going to stop it now before the price drops anymore. We lose more money." So they're throwing people out of their homes. For example, many people in the boom time took out what they call mini ter mini perm mortgages. They were mini permanent. They were short term <laughs> mortgages to be rolled over and renegotiated after three years or five years. Oh, I remember that. I thought, my God, who, who, who but a fool would do that? Well, because you're never telling what's going to come up after yeah, three or yeah. five years. That's right. You've got to come, come up because you've got to come up with the amount of money to for the rest of for the whole thing at the end of this term, five years or whatever. That's right. And that's what's happening. If you bought a hundred thousand dollar house and you put, make payments for five years, then at the end of that five years, you've got to come up and pay off the rest of it. Uh -huh. So, they're foreclosing on those. Now, one of the reasons is, remember in the Southwest plan, they could mark off the good assets that they wanted to keep, and they dumped the rest on the government. And they were allowed to do that for a period of two years after they did the deal. So, what that means is, if after a year and a half, they've got an asset that stopped performing or as we were saying the value drops and it's not well collateralized or the people got behind one month a couple times then they just say well we're not going to deal with this and they write it off and there's you know the person has lost their mortgage lost their home uh, lines of credit that were extended have been shut uh, and and it gets even more ominous uh, I've got a friend who's got uh, small businesses, uh, three of them. Uh, two of them are travel agencies, and uh, over the past several years, he's done a lot of work for the government. So IRS people need to travel around, they use his agency. And so he's built up a, a big stack of accounts receivable from the federal government. Uh, he can't get paid. He's got to keep his business going, so he goes to his local bank. He's worked with him for some time. And he says, uh, can you lend me some money, and I'll give you these accounts receivable from the government as uh, collateral. You know what the bank said? Forget it. Not worth the paper they're printed on. So, hmm. if there's any question at all, they're shutting down. And, and the reason is that it's not worth it's not worth it to them. They have no interest in the community. They're huge. They don't uh, care about faceless people, bureaucracies. Right. I mean, they're just interested in uh, bottom line. Exactly. <laughs> now, on the other hand, mm -hmm. you've got the Resolution Trust Corporation, and that's stockpiling all of these enormous assets. Um, that hangs like a weight over the real estate market in this in this country. Because they have all these properties that can be unloaded that preclude building new ones. Exactly. And now what they've just decided to do, a new policy, is they're packaging huge uh, chunks of real estate and they're selling them to single investors or to single companies. So what we have is in the banking system a concentration and in the real estate a concentration. Mm -hmm. So, once again, as we've seen throughout the 80s, now into the 90s, this enormous concentration of wealth in a few hands. But it's also a concentration of debt. In other words, you have the federal deficit building up, you have deficits from this SNL making claims on uh, federal monies. Well, that's, uh, that's something else that's uh, important, I think, to, to, to uh, look at. Uh, really, what the SNL 
situation has done is borrow money from the future. Okay, because uh, we're uh, selling the, the bonds now, but it's our children that will have to pay them off, pay the principal off, right. and we'll pay interest for 30 years. So it's mortgage, really. Right. It's a mortgage for the, the entire future. economy. That's right. Now, the interesting question is, who buys the Treasury bonds? And it appears that it's one-third foreign investors, and the other two-thirds are sp split roughly in half, financial institutions and corporate capitalists. Which is, again, concentrating property in small amounts of people's exactly. hands. Exactly. I mean, we're, we're basically subsidizing. I mean, it's like uh, it's, uh, the, the term I use, and it's, capital. it's like serfdom. I mean, we're tithing a percentage of our taxes, which is going to rise. Uh, it's already a third of the budget, right? And it's the deficit is better, right? Uh -huh. So uh, I mean, we're going to have to make these interest payments, and then, then our kids are going to have to pay it off, and they're going to pay it to those guys, the wealthy. Who benefited from this whole thing to start out with. Exactly. Could this be a conspiracy of the rich <laughs> to concentrate <laughs> capital in their uh, well, hands? Well, I knew, I knew we somebody have had was going to conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've had some Republicans that captured the state in the 1980s and the 1980s that represent the interests of big corporations and big business. You don't think they were putting through policies that might have just benefited <laughs> them and their friends at the expense of, expense of everyone else? Do you think uh, no, they wouldn't do that. Something that, like that, that could happen in a great democracy? <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said uh, earlier, I, uh, I'm not going to outline any specific conspiracy theory, but boy, it sure makes you That's wonder. the effects. <laughs> Actually, if you have a war with Iraq to deflect attention exactly. from this That's kind of uh, that, thing. Yeah. I mean, this brings the whole question of the media in. To what extent has the media explained any of this complex uh, story that you're telling? Um, I've been getting bits and pieces sometimes from the New York Times and mainly the alternative press, but this is one of the most underreported stories uh, of the century. I know it's funny because uh, the savings and loan crisis is a is a vastly reported story, but it's the it's the it's a surface look. And, and it's what details happened. of individual corruption without seeing the structural exactly. factors behind this, the policy decisions, the games people were playing, the effects of these games. Exactly. And a lot of people are going to be hurt by this. I mean, this is just a disaster. And, you know, we're in pretty good shape here in Texas. I mean, we have all these empty office buildings that eventually will fill up. And, um, uh, you know, all that money that was being siphoned off, a lot of it was siphoned off into Texas. But what's going to happen in the Northeast or in some other place where the money that wasn't sent and now, of course, there's a focus on the regional effects of the bailout. Those people are going to be taxed just like us and they're going to send the money down here. To pay off for the wheelers and dealers in this region That's that exactly. accrued these big gambling debts. That's exactly right. And so there's a, a, a Phil Graham up in the Senate was, was booed and hissed last, uh, the week before they, they stopped, they quit for the summer. Uh, because he suggested that they redistribute some community development grants. And I mean, they were mad at him. They were mad. They said some vile things to that guy. What effect has all this had on various public um, institutions or, or strata such as schools that, are, that rely on uh, taxes, property taxes, where there's all this, uh, all these empty buildings that, and no taxes coming from them. Uh, what's happening? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, our local uh, tax assessor, uh, named Cecilia Burke, says that the Resolution Trust, who of course has to pay the taxes on all those properties, it's part of the carrying costs. Really? Yes, of course. They own it. That's part of the bailout expense. That's, the government owns all these non, all these non-functioning th things. They've got to the, pay taxes on. The Resolution Trust has uh, the uh, rough costs of the assets in the Resolution Trust are 25 percent annually carrying charges, just carrying charges to manage, to keep track of, and pay the taxes. And that's how much a year? Well, right. if they've got uh, what do they got now? 300 billion or 200 200 billion in assets? That's 50 billion a year just in carrying charges that disappears. So you're asking about the total cost. Uh, there are some folks who are now talking about two trillion, and that's, I'm I'm up in that category. That's what I think it's going to be, if you include all these other charges. Now, the problem is 
that the Resolution Trust, according to Cecilia Burke, our local tax assessor, is uh, a deadbeat. They're not paying. They're that. not paying. Now, oh what that means God. is that services, schools, everything that depends Roads, on property, uh, all of water it, development. structural stuff. In yeah. the communities. Yeah. The federal government is paying the taxes through the Resolution Trust to the local community, and if they don't pay, then the funds aren't there. Exactly. Because they would have expected these business and development corporations to pay off. That's right. Plus, you combine that with a credit crunch, a contraction of credit, and shuts down small businesses. People's homes get foreclosed on. Uh, they unemployment. So the tax base goes out there, too. I mean, you, you don't have all this money flowing around, so you can't tax it. This sounds to me like a downward spiral. Oh. I mean, this sounds <laughs> to me <laughs> like something <laughs> worse than the Great Depression is coming. It was just b based on stock market uh -huh. machinations and, and some overinflated, you know, businesses. Well, the, the effect... Now, this sounds structurally much more... The effect uh, is this. Yeah. The middle class is going to disappear. More and more and more people are living in poverty. In fact, uh, there was a report recently in the paper that 32% of the people in this country are effectively living in poverty um, because they're shelter poor. When after they pay their mortgage, they don't have enough left for the basic necessities of life as defined by the federal uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Mm. So that's 78 million, 78 million people this country are already at the poverty level and, it's and just we're just starting word. we're just starting do you think this is going to be sort of slow attrition or is going to be a dramatic crash like the stock market crash of 1929 that was sort of a dramatic event that led to bank closings and then the foreclosures or do you think this is going to be a slower attrition that will be a little harder to see and to figure out well I think uh that it's going to be slow for two reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one, the financial markets are much better regulated now. You know, they've got these automatic shutoffs if the Dow drops so far, and uh, uh, they have other kinds of regulatory internal checks on the crashing. Um, the other factor is that we've got what is called, it has been called, a rolling recession. So uh, the Midwest goes down. It bottoms out, starts to slide up a little bit, and then Texas goes down, it bottoms out, and then New England starts to go down. So it's distributing the depression or recession to different parts of the country. Um, I think that the key uh, problems are, or if there is a big crash, it will come from the international markets. Uh, right now the dollar is still the standard of currency in, in, the, in global markets. And uh, the Japanese are uh, hard afoot to get off the dollar standard and go to a more independent measure. And when that happens, our currency is going to be worth uh, less than the Argentine real or whatever they call their money. I mean, it's uh, we're going we're gonna to be look like third world already. A cab ride from the airport in Tokyo uh, costs two hundred and fifty dollars. So it's like a Mexican peasant coming up here and taking a cab ride and trying to pay in pesos. And it's a quarter of his annual earnings, right? Well, now if you go to Tokyo and you take a cab down, down, 250 bucks. Well, it sounds to me like we need a war with Iraq to distract <laughs> attention from all of these economic woes that uh, this is more entertainment for the people, seeing uh, battles in the uh, desert and hostage struggles. And uh, exactly. Th this, this is sort of uh, a popular culture, you know, good versus evil. Uh, exactly. In which Hitler. we're good and they're evil. There's Hitler out there to fight. Whereas if you look to see who the bad guys are in the savings and loan, this whole financial debacle, it's, it's the establishment. It's exactly. the Congress, the presidency, the regulators, the wheelers and dealers. The entirety of the system is implicated in this. Exactly. Well, you know, if you go back and look at economic history, uh, like the Great Depression or others that uh, may or may not have been engineered by the big bankers, <clears throat> like uh, Pierpont Morgan, etc. Uh, so frequently when things happened, 
it looked like economic forces were doing it, whereas other people who go back and look at it later and they find out, hey, there were certain manipulations that were going on that resulted in these things. And then what happened when the economy would collapse or there was a big depression, a lot of people were hurt, but the big guys up at the top would always prosper because they would go in and buy real estate and other property at very and various businesses at uh, very low cost so that they would really benefit and there would be more and more concentration of ownership up at the top. As a matter of fact, I read an article in one of the uh, Wall Street Journal Assembly said a lot of the very wealthy people and wealthy in, uh, financial institutions have been building up an enormous war chest of extra money so that when the big crash comes they can come in and buy up all, all this stuff that will be fire sale. There's right. a famous quotation uh, attributed to Baron von Rothschild, one of the great famous bankers of all time, and that quotation is, the best time to buy is when blood is running in the streets. And that's where we are. Anyway, was his exactly. and turn into assets that could be personal or corporate that he could exactly. control outside of the and, framework. And of so the then it SNL. meant that he really had no loyalty to the organization. Exactly because he had no money in it. Oh. He had already lost his money. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> and this began actually with Carter or when Reagan um, first came in as president? Well, the, the problems in the thrift industry uh, began in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, it dates back to uh, us going off the gold standard and floating interest rates and all of that. It goes back to Nixon, really. Uh-huh, exactly, right. 71. And then the high inflation under Carter and uh -huh. high interest rates. Exactly. And they forced them to give a lot of money. I was getting 17% at one time yeah. uh, for money market. <laughs> well, Prime, certificates. prime rate got up over 20% at one right. point in the 78 thing. So, uh, uh, there's a, a point about the psychology here. The regulators were giving everybody a break because they didn't want to have to shut it, shut it all down. They didn't have enough money in the, interest, in the insurance fund to cover all these deposits anyway. The FSLIC. The FSLIC, mm -hmm. right. So, uh, the owners were kind of set up already, psychologically. <laughs> now, in 1982, the famous Deregulation Act occurs, and that's Garn San Germain. Uh, we've all we've heard of it. We've talked about that, all the right. skullduggery and corruption that went on in that. Right. Well, uh, let, me, let me just uh, go through a couple of the provisions of Garn San Germain and show how they, they had, the kind of effect they had. First of all, they dropped the capital requirement from 5% to 3%. They, uh -huh. Okay, so that meant your reserves had only to be 3%. Now, that had an interesting effect, particularly with the people that wanted to buy in. Okay. They didn't need as much. They didn't need as much. So if you mm -hmm. had a $100 million bank, a medium-sized uh, thrins for each deposit, uh, to $100,000. Okay, now, that one's pretty well known. Now, in addition, right around that time, because the thrift industry was in so much trouble, the regulators began to grant what they call forbearances. Uh, now, Part of the regula uh, regulatory apparatus was that each thrift had to maintain a certain amount of reserve money on hand. It was calculated as a percentage of assets, assets being uh, out outstanding loans and any uh, property uh, or any other asset that uh, the thrift owned. Uh, and they had to maintain 5%. Uh, which means that if the thrift was liquidated on a given day, they had to have at least 5% left. Anything under that, and they were in violation of the rules, and technically they were insolvent, they could be closed. But because uh, the whole industry was in trouble, the regulators took it easy on them, and they granted uh, forbearances, which allowed them to carry uh, a lower capital reserve than the law required. Now, what that effectively meant was, see, if you, if you were a thrift owner and that 5% that capital reserve was really your profit, because if you liquidated the thrift on any given day, what was left over was what you took home. So, in the early 80s, with these four, uh, when the thrifts were in trouble, there were, many of the thrifts had no capital reserve, which meant that the owner had no more stake in the thrift. He had already oh. lost his money, see? 
So, so anything that he could grab then. Exactly. In, in, but there's much more behind this, isn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, it appears that there were uh, structural changes in many areas that relate to uh, thrift banking that really uh, created as much of this disaster as the um, these evil uh, uh, SNL owners like uh, Keating and Don Dixon. You mean like changes in the laws and uh, uh -huh. policy of oh, regulatory man. agencies? And, and uh, what the federal government did to these people is just brutal. I mean, for the, those people who are interested in conspiracy theories, I'm sure somebody <laughs> could find something. Yeah, I'm not going to uh, come up with anything uh, uh, right today, but uh, I mean, there are some threads in here that are really nasty. Yeah. Uh, well, tell us about what some of these changes. Apparently, they made changes and lured some of these uh, naughty exactly, guys into it. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all. Uh, it's pretty well known that uh, at the end of the 70s, the thrift industry was on the ropes uh, because of rising interest rates and uh, uh, the thrifts had their money uh, invested in long-term mortgages. And uh, as interest rates on deposits rose, people took their money out of thrifts and put them in um, money market funds, uh, banks, and other agencies that uh, give them a higher return. So. Um, now, thrifts were carefully regulated uh, and had been all throughout their history. Uh, they were designed just for uh, uh, single-family homes, basically. Uh, well, in 1980, the first step was taken, and that was to lift the cap on interest rates and raise the amount of insurance that was up for sale in a small town in Texas, for example. Uh, all you needed to come up with was three million bucks to buy that bank and you set that aside as a capital reserve and you were off and running. And some people bought some very big banks with even less than that. Yeah, well, there were some would, famous stories of this Florida guy. Uh-huh, exactly, with promises that they were going to make it up and they had investors and all of this. Now, the other, uh, another interesting part of Garn Saint Germain was it allowed the banks to take 6% loan origination fee on any loan they made. Now, what that means huh. is that you go into a town, you buy a hundred million dollar bank, you put up three million bucks. The next thing you do is you loan that hundred million out and you take a six percent loan origination fee and you just put three million dollars in your pocket. So you're, you're being paid to loan money to whoever, exactly. any shady wheeler or dealer. Hey. You're going to get your and six took percent it fee front. and the government will insure the loan if it goes bad. Exactly, and you took it up front. So you're encouraged to give bad loans by this bill. In a sense, yes. And they didn't make any difference to them if they were paid back or not because they had their 6% exactly. of price. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now, the, uh, savings and loans were allowed by Garn Saint Germain to branch out into all kinds of investments. In fact, they were allowed to uh, invest directly in commercial real estate projects. So, what they all did was uh, the minute Garn Saint Germain was passed, they all set up a holding company, a construction holding company, um, uh, sort of off to the side. And then they would uh, loan money to the construction company, and the construction company would go ahead and develop uh, property. So the first thing they all did was uh, they designed office towers. Well, this savings and loan crisis thing is really struck a responsive chord around the United States. We've been getting more mail from the programs which we've done on the savings and loan crisis with Rob Whittison than any other subject, uh, even those of the CIA or the Kennedy assassination. People are astounded by it and they want to hear more about it. And you're becoming, you're becoming a superstar. Everybody's getting these letters, you know, they want to know about you and people stopping you on the streets. And not only that, Rob has become uh, one of the country's experts and has been taken into the confidence of some of the high executives of these uh, savings and loan institutions. Investment bankers are, are calling him up and spilling their guts to him and business organization calling him. Tell us what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of this? This is the weirdest situation I think I've ever seen and all of this seems to be focused on you because you uh, I've been writing articles and uh, been on TV and people recognize you and think you've got all the answers <laughs> <laughs> well I don't have many answers but I have been studying this uh, pretty carefully for a year and uh, uh, the more I probe into it uh, the more 
detail I see naturally and uh, so one of the problems is that now that I've been doing it for so long I have a kind of a responsibility to try and explain uh, what I see hap uh, happening and uh, what has happened uh, to cause this uh, enormous uh, financial disaster. Now, Rob, let's say today if we can get the uh, big picture. So far all the media has done in this SNL crisis is to blame guys like Neil Bush or Charles Keene as if it's just a few entrepreneurs that went uh, berserk, rich kids uh, gambling with uh, the taxpayers' money, that that's all the savings and loan scandal really amounts to. 